What's up everyone, Jessica Dean here. Today's video is going to dive even deeper into the world of Docker files, AKA the RTFM for your application. Today, we're gonna to learn how to work with environment variables in our applications and how we can then consume those environment variables in our Docker files. We're then gonna wrap all of this up. We're gonna deploy it over into Azure. Let's have some fun. All right, so we are back in Visual Studio Code. We are in our Croc Hunter project, and I can open up my crockhunter.go application. Now, I know the problem right off the bat is that we have hard coded our HTTP listen port to be port 80. We need to change this to something more dynamic, and the best way to do this is to use an environment variable. In Go, we can add in logic like this, where we set lowercase port equal to an operating system environment variable of uppercase port. If port has not been defined or if it's empty, then go ahead and set port equal to 8080, and that will become our default port. We will output that behavior to our console log. If port has been defined, we will output that behavior also to our console log with the port that we have overridden our environment variable with. Once we have our environment variable logic in place, we can then use that in our HTTP listen call. So I'm just gonna change port 8080 to now use that environment variable. So we're gonna go ahead and hit save. Now, this is obviously very specific to Go. If you, as the .NET Core, .NET, Ruby, Python, Java, you as the expert developer you are, will be able to determine the best way to handle this type of logic in your application. But I challenge you to consider where your application is running beyond just your local environment so you don't have to retroactively go back and make these changes after the fact. Instead, you can think about how to make your application more dynamic as you're programming. Once we have this logic in place, we can go ahead and collapse and close our Go application, and we can move on to our Docker file. Now, this is the same Docker file that we built together last week. I've simply appended a dot multi-stage to the end of it. I wanted to show you how you can work with Docker files when you have multiple Docker files in your project. So you'll see how we can specify a file when we get to our build stage. Since I'm also in Visual Studio Code, I'm just gonna click plain text here at the bottom, and I'm gonna go ahead and search for Docker file, and I will update this syntax to look as though I would be in a normal Docker file naming convention. Once we have changed our process environment variable in our Go application, we now need to make sure that we are consuming that environment variable in our Docker file. So first, rather than hard coding port 8080 as the port we exposed, we need to make that dynamic. We can do that by doing something like this, where we use curly braces, and we simply set that equal to uppercase port, right? That was our OS, our, our local environment variable naming convention or casing that we set. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit save. Now that we've done that, we can try to build our image and take a look and see how it works. So let's go ahead and zoom in here, and I'm just gonna do a quick Docker build. And this is the same command we ran last week. Since we're going to be working with a new task, I'm gonna give it a new local tag. I'm gonna go ahead and name this one Croc Hunter Port. And because again, we talked about Docker files, I am not trying to build this Docker file. I am trying to build the Docker file dot multi stage. So I'm simply going to add Docker file dot multi stage, and we're going to go ahead and hit enter. This is now going to RTFM or read all the lines that we have put in our Docker file, and it will build. You can notice right down here it does say that it has successfully tagged Croc Hunter port. So let's go ahead and clear. And let's make sure that we don't have any containers naming Croc Hunter running, otherwise we will get an error. It does say that there are no such containers. So now let's go ahead and try to run our new image in a container. Let's go ahead and change this image version that we want to Croc Hunter port version one. And since we now have our expose port set as an environment variable, we can use the dash E flag with Docker run before our port forwarding, but after Docker run. And we can use the dash E to set our environment variable using our key value pair. So I'm just gonna set port as uppercase. And let's go ahead and try to use port 3000. 
Anything that our application is listening on that then we expose in our container needs to line up with our port forwarding call. So remember the right port or the right side of the colon right here is the port inside the container. We're simply going to change this to port 3000. To keep things simple, I will change the port I use locally, the port on the left side of the colon, to also be port 3000. So now let's go ahead and hit enter. And you can see that our logic is already working great. Our default port has been overridden. We are using port 3000 and our server has started. We are listening on port 3000. Since we have just done an even port mapping of 3000 to 3000, let's head on over to our browser and we're just gonna go to localhost 3000. Hit enter and there is our application. Croc Hunter is working, here's our little host name. We learned last week that when we see a host name like that, we are inside a container. So this looks great. We are all but ready to upload it into Docker Hub so we can deploy it out to Azure container instances. The only problem is we haven't actually done our due diligence when it comes to testing. We haven't tested the scenario that we want to use our application in, meaning we want our application accessible on port 80. And believe it or not, port 80 and port 443 differs from other non-conventional TCP ports. You'll see what I mean in a second. Let me go ahead and clear the screen. I'm gonna remove any exited container here. And let's go ahead and try to rerun that docker run command. Only this time, we're gonna go ahead and change the port to port 80. Okay, so we'll change our environment variable and we'll make sure that the container we are mapping to in our, in our container, the port, is correct. So I'll simply hit enter. And uh-oh, we now have a TCP bind permission denied issue. This is where I said that mapping or binding to TCP port 80 or 443 is a little different because in Linux, Binding has the expectation that you're root. Since we learned last week, the importance of running our containers as non-root, our application can't bind. Now, probably the easiest way to solve this would be to remove our user level and allow our container to run as root. Only that's a horrible idea. We absolutely should not do that because it is completely unsecure. Instead, Linux actually gives us the ability to allow capabilities per process. So we can allow root capabilities to our application without granting all root permissions to the entire container. Let's see what that looks like. Underneath our copy command, after we have our application in this new container stage, I'm gonna add in a second line and let's break it down here. I'm adding in a line that says APK add. Remember, we are working in an Alpine based image. So we're going to be using APK add as our package manager install command, as opposed to apt install. We're gonna use the libcap package. This is a library capabilities package. We'll use double ampersand to, if this is successful, we will go ahead and link a second command. And we'll use set cap. This is going to set our capabilities for our NetBind service. Now I will link the man page and my blog post walking you through how to do all this down below, but pretty much what this command says is go ahead and allow NetBind service capability to our app.crockhunter, okay? So let's go ahead and save this. And let's go ahead and kind of clean up here. I'm gonna remove our Croc Hunter container. And since we made a change to our RTFM for our application or to our Docker file, we need to make sure that we rebuild that Docker file. So I'm gonna rebuild it and hit enter, but we still have another error. We are getting another permission denied issue. And if we actually take a deeper look at it, the problem is that it doesn't have access to run our new APK add. That's the command that is failing. It's failing because as non-root, we don't have permissions to install any packages. And Docker files work with order of operations. The order you put your RTFM commands very much matters. Anything that we have after line 18 here with user 1000 is now running as non-root. So we can solve this by actually putting these commands in an order that makes sense. Since we need to install packages as root, We'll just change our user permissions to non-root after that package is installed, but before we expose our port and before we actually run our process. This way our process will still run as non-root. So let's go ahead and save. This will build successfully now. So we will quickly make sure that I spell that correctly. Let's make sure that we do Docker build and we will hit enter. There we go. Our image has now successfully built because we have put all the commands in an order that makes sense. 
So now I'll zoom in here and I'm just gonna rerun that command where we routed our port 80 and we binded over to port 80. And if I hit enter, you'll notice that the default port has been overridden. We are using port 80 and our server is able to start and listen on port 80 because we have successfully binded. Now, before we go take a look at our application working, let's make sure that our application is truly running as non-root. So I just opened a second terminal tab here and we learned how to do this last week where we could run or execute commands against a running container. So I'll do docker exec, the name of the container is crop hunter, and I'm just gonna do psox to see a list of processes in that container. You can see that even though our package install command ran as root, our application or our process is still running as user 1000, which means our container is still running as non-root. Now, if we take a look at the images we built and we search for Croc Hunter, I make this just a little bit larger so you can see the top line here. Here's our Croc Hunter port and it's getting cut off just a little bit. Let me zoom out here. It looks like it's about 23.8 megabytes. It's up from 14.4 megabytes. So we did add about 10 megabytes by adding that capability package, but that extra 10 megabytes, I feel is a worthwhile price to pay rather than granting the entire container root permissions. So let's go back over to just our Docker terminal here and we'll double check that our application is accessible. We will refresh. Remember before I refresh, the host name before was 0A8. After refreshing, we now are in a host name that starts with 078. I can click start and I can continue to live out my dreams hunting crocodiles. Now we are ready to upload this new image, this fixed image over into Docker Hub so we can deploy it out to Azure Container Instances. I'm gonna go ahead and remove the running container. We'll zoom in here real quick and I'm just gonna tag my Croc Hunter port image as a name that makes sense for Docker Hub. We learned how to do this last week. And then I'm gonna go ahead and push that image over into Docker Hub, which again is a publicly available registry. So you can go access it, you can pull this down and live out your own dreams of hunting crocodiles. But more importantly, we can very easily reconfigure our container that we previously deployed to container instances. We can redeploy it with this updated image. Let's go check Docker Hub now that it says it uploaded and we'll just refresh here to see if it's ready. It looks like it is, here's our Croc Hunter port. We'll go ahead and drill down into this. We saw a little bit of this last week, so we can click on tags. We see that we have our tag one, and I can use this naming convention of JLDean slash Croc Hunter port tag one. So that looks great. Let's flip back over here to Visual Studio Code. And I know in my iPad video, I showed you how you could use Azure Cloud Shell in the browser from any environment, even an iPad. But what you may not know is you can also access your Azure Cloud Shell right from within Visual Studio Code. To do that, simply go over here on the left and find your extensions button. That's this little icon right here. Go ahead and search for Azure and find the Azure account extension. It looks something like this with a key. Once you have that extension installed, you can then open your command palette. On Mac, that's Command-Shift-P. On Windows, that might be Control-Shift-P. Go ahead and search for Azure Open Bash in Cloud Shell. You'll notice that my terminal has now opened a third terminal of Bash in Cloud Shell. You can see that it requested a Cloud Shell and it connected to that terminal. Let's go ahead and collapse the side window here so we can see a little bit better. And let's go ahead and also do a history command. You can see the various commands that I've ran previously. I can do an LS and I can see the folders I had access to even on my iPad. Remember, this is just backed by a storage account. So this is everything you're seeing here is going to be the same regardless of how I access it, whether it's in a browser, whether it's in Visual Studio Code, whether I'm accessing it from my iPad or from a Windows system. So now we're ready to rerun our AZ container create command. Only this time we're gonna make sure that we use our updated port. I'm gonna do AZ container create. This is very similar to what we just did on the iPad. I'm gonna do dash G, I'm gonna do ACI Docker JD. That's the name of my resource group. I will do dash N for ACI Docker JD. Remember that's the name of our container in Azure. Now for dash dash image, I need to make sure I use my new image that we just uploaded. So I'll do croc hunter dash port, and we're gonna make sure that we use version one. Drop down to another line, and we're gonna make sure to reset up our DNS, make sure that that's still working. So I'll do DNS name label, 
The label we gave previously was JD Croc Hunter. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and then add in an environment variables. Okay, and this is again very similar to the dash E that we do locally when we do Docker run. We're just gonna do our key value pair again. So I'll do port equals, that's an equal sign right now, and then equals port 80. We're gonna tab down to one more line and I'll do dash dash ports and make sure that that is also port 80. Now I hit enter and this command is going to go out and it's going to redeploy our Azure container instance with this new updated image that we just fixed together. All right, so now that that deployed, we can actually head over to our browser here and I already have my existing container up. Let me go ahead and refresh. You can see that everything still looks like it's good. The status is good. We can go over into our containers and we can see any events under properties. We can see the name, we can see the image. We can also see the image up here under our container information. But most importantly, we can see the port has been updated to port 80. And scrolling down, I can see the environment variables were set appropriately where port is now equal to 80. So we can actually test and make sure our application works by going back over to overview, grabbing our FQDN, opening a new tab, and pasting that in. Now our application is accessible on port 80 because we thought about the way that we programmed it and made our application as dynamic as possible. All right, so there you have it. That's how easy it is to get started with Docker files, environment variables, and then get them over into a cloud, i.e. Azure, so that you can then live out your dreams hunting crocodiles. If this video helped you, please like it, please share it, please subscribe to the channel, tap the bell notification, and I will see you next time.